So the 23-24 season is almost done, but we're still doing podcasts. All right, my guest today is uh, coming to us uh, not from Switzerland, but he's a Swiss skater. He's an incredible inline skater and a really, really good master art skater all the way from Germany. Let's welcome Livio Wenger. Good morning, good afternoon. What's up? I am Swiss, though, just so you know. Yeah, yeah, you are definitely Swiss, but you are, you are a few minutes across the border in Germany, right. which is a good place to be. For sure. Uh, but you were telling me that uh, essentially... After uh, World Single Distance in Calgary, your season, your ice season is pretty much over, huh? Yeah, yeah, but uh, that's a decision made long in the making. We already planned that in the start of the season to only go to World Single Distances. Reasoning for it is I had some injury, a broken collarbone in the summer. And right after I recovered from that, I competed in the inline world championships. And then, yeah, through that, it was just a solid two months of build up training gone. And now we're getting, yeah, definitely closer and closer to the Olympics again. So we want to have an early start into into the build-up. Already start in March with it rather than April, late April. So to kind of catch up a little bit on endurance work. Um, so that was the reasoning behind it. And also with the all-rounds is, uh, I've done it many times. Um, yeah, my best result was ninth. And I just didn't really have the confidence to to exceed that ninth place at the moment. Um, so that's why also the decision was to not take part in it. Even though it was a really hard decision because it was an insel, I trained yeah. so much there. I have so much friends there. So I would, I would have loved to compete there, that's for sure. Do you I might actually go watch, but I'm not, I'm not sure yet. Do you like a 10K? I, I really do, even though it's not my best race, but uh, I also love the 5K. The 5K is actually my favorite race to race, personally. Um, this year, my shape hasn't been great for the 5K, so it got a lot harder, um, <laughs> a lot harder to enjoy, too. But the better you're in shape, the more enjoyable the races are. Um, but I find beauty in every single race, to be honest. If it's the 500 or the 10K, each race has its beauty. Yeah. And... Uh, that's the that's the fun part about speed skating. So, do you think the the fitness issues were a result of that injury? No, not not only. It's 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 been like yeah, I've been probably in the best shape of my life in in the last Olympic season. Um, I had some really really great races there. I managed to get my time down to six twelve in Salt Lake, and I was actually disappointed with that at the time because I was skating so much faster in training. Um, so yeah, and also I already had great preseason races where I was really close to guys like Sven Kramer or Jan Blockhausen and those guys in, in Insel preseason tests and that was all out of training and then the season did really come fully together in the 5k. I got COVID in, 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 the, in, the, in the third World Cup in Salt Lake. Then I was just happy to be qualified for the for the games, but honestly, COVID hit me really, really, really bad, um, mm. and it took me more than a year to really, almost two years to really get back to a decent fitness level. And I still feel now I'm running behind my shape a bit, and mm. that's also the goal now in the next two years to really try to get that back. Yeah. So you 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 mentioned it, and everybody knows that you're a Swiss skater, right? Mm -hmm. And you got your start in inline, and you did a lot of inline before you ever came to ice, which is kind of a reoccurring theme on this channel. I seem to be drawn to inline skaters that have gone to ice, but um, how old were you when you were first on wheels? I think I started with six or with seven, so it was quite funny. I had a godfather, or I still have the godfather. And uh, his son was a was a speed skater, and he was at a back then European Championships in I don't even know must have been ninety nine two thousand something something around there. And uh, he brought me some kid skates from there, and uh, yeah, he came uh, visit my family. My dad and him had a good bottle of wine, and I suddenly got those speed skates, and I haven't seen them all night. I was just on my speed skates. I even slept in them. 
So I basically never took him off again, yeah. Oh, that's awesome. Well, I think uh, fans of Livio Wenger um, will have seen some of this video, but I want to play a little bit of video. I think you know the one I'm talking about. I think you were <laughs> yeah, I, I know what's 11 years old. Um, yeah. It is all in German, but uh, we can we can translate a little bit. So this is a little uh -huh. video of you finishing a race, but the most important part, I think, is that that kind of final interview with you. So let's watch these clips real quick. All right. All right, that's one, and then this. Seine Ziele kann er jetzt auf jeden Fall schon einmal hochstecken. Weltmeister oder Europameister und sicher mal Schweizer Meister. Yes, Weltmeister. So you uh, you were thinking world yeah. champion back then. Yeah, obviously. I Me, mean, it's a kid's dream to become world champion, Olympic champion, and uh, it's still a dream of mine. Having quite got there I got a medal now but I hopefully that's the first step to it even though I'm already 31 so my time is running out a bit but I'll keep fighting for it I just I thought it was uh it was cool that you had a coach skating along with you with a camera which mm -hmm. tells me that you must have been a bit of a favorite in that field if uh he's willing to get out there and skate with everybody and carry a camera along yeah, it was uh, it was a pretty cool story. It's but it also shows how far my relationship with my current coach Kalen Dobbin goes back now. Uh, back then, I just looked up to him. Um, he was one of my favorite inline skaters, if not the favorite inline skater. And uh, we always had a strong connection from back then already. And yeah, I was just a little kid trying to be like him, basically. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, that he became one day my coach. Many years later, it's it's a pretty cool story. Yeah. And you're still you could write a book you're about still it. with him, right? Yeah, 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 for sure. So our way split a little bit. Um, not too long after this video, the the inline scene kind of got a big dip in Europe. So back then we had the series, the Swiss Inline Cup and the World Inline Cup. That was massive. And there was a lot of professional inline skaters all around Europe. And that's how he came to Europe too. And uh, anyway, so it started getting a little dip, sponsors started jumping off. He actually switched team to Team Powers Light. And uh, so he moved from Switzerland to Germany. So yeah, like I said, our way split a bit, but I always managed to see him throughout the summer at some races. I always tried to talk to him as much as I could, like just a little kid. and. And that's how special he was. He took the time to talk to a little kid that back then hardly spoke English. And I think that's that's basically how it started. And then, uh, yeah, many, many years later in 2010, I was at the World Championships in Colombia. And uh, he was still competing himself for New Zealand. So I went in there quite early because it was on high altitude and over 2,000 meters. And uh, so I went in really early and I just asked, hey, can I train a little bit with you guys? Because I was a Swiss skater all alone. I was there with my mom. I had no one. And he was just, yeah, no problem. Come in. And he took me in. He helped me a lot. And I ended up walking away with a, with a medal there. And that was also thanks to him already back then who was believing in me. He was even coaching me a little bit on the side already. And he didn't have to do that. And then, um, then yeah, I, I asked him, because my parents, like the Swiss inline scene was so small back then. Um, and my parents were also a little bit in the Federation. And so we had to talk to him if he would be interested in becoming the Swiss inline national coach. And he was interested. And then, then yeah, it, it happened a year later. In 11, he started being the Swiss national coach on inline, which he actually still is, is now, yeah. Hmm. So do you remember, <clears throat> like, at what point did you start thinking about maybe you were going to try ice? Um, my first real um, yeah, conversation that I had about ice or like thoughts about ice I had was actually in 2006. Mm -hmm. So it was the Olympic Games in Torino and I saw, I saw Chad Hatterick compete, who I knew was an inline skater. I have never seen him skate live because I was a bit too young. But then I heard, ooh, this was the best inline skater ever. I knew how many world titles he had. 
and he was winning the Olympics. And I thought like, whoa, this is kind of cool. But I was always like, yeah, inline is cool. I was a little naive kid who didn't even know inline wasn't Olympic. So <laughs> once I learned that inline wasn't Olympic, it became more and more of thought. But then it actually took four years more until Vancouver. That was in 2010, right? Yeah, 2010. So, yeah, that was the first year I actually stayed up for the opening ceremony um, just to watch it. And that's really where my Olympic dream started, to be honest. And uh, that's where I started first time thinking about, okay, what do I need? What do I have to do? I was still in school, still in education in Switzerland. So there I also realized, oh my God, this is extremely difficult. And then, <laughs> then in 2011, actually 2011 or 2000, yeah, it was 2011. I just, yeah, got into more touch with Kalen again. And he was actually trying ice skating for himself in, in Salt Lake City. So I asked in my sports holiday, I had two weeks holiday, I took two weeks off school. So, hey, can I come for a month to Salt Lake City? Can I try some ice skating? And he was like, of course, of course. He, he was always super helpful. So he took me in and uh, yeah, I skated. And I was, I was immediately fascinated by the sport. And that's always something I told me, if I couldn't love the sport, there's no way I'm gonna do it. So yeah, I, I went over there in, in 2011 and did a month of speed skating. And then after that, I basically decided, okay, this is what I want. I wanna, I wanna become an ice skater as well. And um, what I got told straight away from a lot of inline skaters that already did the switches, like like Alexi Conte and stuff, they they told me, ah, oh, just keep inlining. We all did the mistake and stopped inline skating. So that's why I always kept inline skating too. But it took me many many years to really understand how to do it, and yeah, it was very very tough in the start. And so yeah, fast forward a couple of years. I had to stay after this actually one more year in, in, in Switzerland to finish education. I actually had the conversation with my parents there. It's like, hey, mom, dad, uh, how about me quitting school and education so I can maybe make the Olympics in 14? <laughs> and they were like, no, 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 my friend, you stay right here and finish school. <laughs> and I was like, okay, okay. So there my first Olympic dream kind of broke a little bit, uh, which what is looking back now, there is no way I would have made it. But yeah, it was, uh, it was definitely the right decision. And yeah, so then in 2013, I actually joined the uh, Kia Speedskate Academy back then in Enzo. And so this wasn't with Kaylin Dobbin. So I started having coaching from Jeremy Waterspoon back then or, or uh, Wim De Nelson from Holland. Uh, they were the two coaches. So I basically was in the all round program with Wim De Nelson. And he, yeah, it was a very, very challenging uh, two years there I had um, because I just really, I think the big mistake I did there was I went too fast into a professional environment. I didn't learn how to skate. So I straight away could skate, but yeah, it was only a year on ice or something and they made me they talked about ah oh, put your hip do this do that it was way too like how you say it was too much details for me on a very very high level what i need today 10 years later but back then i literally needed to skate like a kid i needed to skate i needed to learn baby drills i needed to start from scratch yeah. and that's what i didn't do and it's, if i could go back to something i would change now um, but yeah, you can't change, you learn from your mistakes a lot. So yeah, then uh, after two years in the academy, I was either gonna, because I was really in a tough mental spot, I said, uh, I'll, I'll either retire, I'm done with it, because I'm still only doing 646, this is, come on, I'm way better than that, that's what I thought. And then I asked Kaylin Dobbin to, to help me out again, who was still my inline coach at the time, and I said, hey, look, I wanna do it right. And then, yeah, we decided that summer to go to Salt Lake City to start the ice season a bit early. And then the funny story is we went to Rion K, a New Zealand speed skater who was struggling himself at the moment. Um, I just started training uh, on inline with Peter Michael. And then we somehow got Kalen's brother Shane Dobbin back 
So there was the New Zealand team pursuit born, and I was kind of part of it. <laughs> and um, they became so successful so fast. I think they got a silver medal at Worlds. Um, yeah, so I just basically went from 2015 till, till 2018. I went with those three guys everywhere. We did everything together. And yeah, that's basically when I really started swing things around. The results came. I learned that I was pretty good in a mass start. <laughs> And uh, yeah, I got better every year for sure. And then, so let's let's go back to the um, that first month <clears throat> that you did in mm -hmm. Salt Lake when you first put ice blades on. Um, in those four weeks, did you do any time trials? Yeah, I did. I did. I did. <laughs> I, did. I think after I think after two weeks, I did a three k, and I believe it was a four fourteen. Mm. I had no idea if that was good or bad at the time. Uh, I'm not even sure. I might have even been a Swiss national junior record already. And then after three weeks, I think I did another 3K, which was a 404 or 5, if I'm not mistaken. And then after the four weeks, I did a 5K, and that was a 702, I believe. And I did some 500s, I think 38.9, 1K, maybe 116, 115. So, yeah, I still remember the times, I think. Yeah. I don't know if I'm correct or not. <laughs> well, I, I think it's just cool that you, um, you know, had the courage to go to the line when you had only been on them for a short time. So yeah, that, yeah. That shows that you're, you know, you you certainly know what you're doing on, on skates. Um, you know, you're clearly an accomplished skater. I, I always think about when they show the, the video of the very first time that Aaron Jackson got on ice, you know, when Amazing, she's, just, yeah. she's stepping out and she yeah. looks so, but I'm sure if you kept the camera rolling, probably 10 minutes later, she's looking pretty decent. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, I, I'm pretty sure it was very similar with me. Um, to be, to be hundred percent honest, my very first time on ice was not in Salt Lake. It actually was, a few weeks earlier in Davos, I went to a went on ice with Martin Henke. Yeah. And, uh, and he just gave me skates for one day. And then, yeah, that was actually my very first time on ice. And I was like, oh my God, this is slippery. But yeah, already there, I, I really I really enjoyed it. And and then, yeah, then the month in Salt Lake helped a lot, of course. Yeah. yeah. So at that point, I, I'm assuming you kind of felt like, all right, you want to do this, but then you... Like you said, you're you weren't really getting the right coaching. You were getting coaching up here when you really needed to be down here. But mm -hmm. once again, you know this theme with your coach. Um, it seems like the so many things have happened to you have been related to him. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. It's but I also believe it's because he's always been um, an inspiration to me and. Uh, Honestly, I think if a coach is not kind of an inspiration to you or, or understands you in a, in, a, in, a, in a deep, deep understanding, then it's already pretty hard. And I think that's also sometimes very incredibly hard in, in team sports or like football teams and, or basketball teams. So there's just 15, 20, 30 guys in a team and the coach says what you have to do. And sometimes it's so impersonal. But in a, in a sport like speed skating, I do believe there has to be some kind of personal connection with your coach and uh yeah it's uh it's actually quite interesting too like in in holland for example like you can see quite a lot people just change coaches so it doesn't work change coach go to the next one like in, in a lot of other nations that doesn't really happen because it just it just doesn't happen like a lot of people go with one or one or two coaches their career and just to have that deep connection to them and the understanding and and also, yeah, like Switzerland doesn't have high-level coaches. It's just the way it is. That's why I have a New Zealand coach. And uh, it's a bit different for sure, yeah. You should get a New Zealand passport. No, no, no. no. I'm not happy to this time with these guys. You're an honorary yeah. New Zealander. Yeah, no, no. I, I mean, uh, people even say I talk a little bit Kiwi-ish, but I, I don't think that's true. <laughs> But um, no, I, there's there's definitely a connection to New Zealand there, and I really want to go visit New Zealand one day. I haven't been unfortunately, yeah. but I'll definitely go one day. Yeah. That's a that's a commitment. So, one of the things that I think we've seen over the course of time is 
quite often in liners, especially the more, um, uh, I would say the more um, endurance athlete in liners mm -hmm. really seem to do well with mass start. And I think mm -hmm. a lot of it has to do that you guys are generally mostly skating in packs. And I, I'm fascinated by the, um, the 10 K elimination race, um, mm -hmm. which I can't imagine how brutal that is 50 laps and trying not to fall off the back end. So I, I just grabbed a little video of this, of, of one of your races. And before I play it, I want people to understand that the clip that we're going to see here towards the end, you guys already have like 48 laps in your legs. <laughs> as you're trying to get to the finish. So let's just watch this one quick. Tati sono i due belgi, è passato davanti Jason Suttles. E Bramante ancora quarto, ancora quarto, ma siamo all'ultimo giro. Jason Suttles, Bart Swings, Livio Venga, e qui siamo all'arrivo. Jason Suttles davanti. E sembra lui, gli fa un po' da tappo Bart. E, ed è lui, ed è lui, il... And the new European champion from Belgium, Jason Suttles. Oh, good so race. You were in fourth, and then the guy that was in third just couldn't hang anymore. You passed him, so you're able to hang on and get a podium. But mm -hmm. I mean, that just so people understand, you know, it's a small track, it's tight. You do 50 laps, it's elimination, and there's 30 guys at the start. So yeah. what's what's the strategy there? Try to be somewhere near the front the whole way and... Yeah, it's... Uh, <laughs> I think the, the elimination race on, on inline skates uh, is probably the toughest race tactically, mentally. Because, especially for me, because I was alone um, against all these bigger nations like Belgium. First of all, they had bar swings, yeah. <laughs> one of the greatest speed skaters of all time. And uh, he was not even the leader of the team in that race. It was his teammate. So it's already to compete against two, two, two greats like that and then have three Italians, three French and so on it's in, it's incredibly tough alone to to somehow get through the race and uh it took me many many years to be honest to be competitive in the elimination race um because you have to save the energy at the right time you have to use the energy at the right time and uh, yeah i started getting better and better lately and i think that translates a lot to the to the mass start and uh i really do believe that the inline skaters have a tactical advantage in the mass start. I believe the, the short trackers, the people that come from short track, have the technical advantage in the corners, which you can see really well with like Ebony Blondin or, or Antoine Shelley Nabulieu or, or Sung Hun Lee. Um, and then I really believe the inline skaters, such as Bart, Joey Mantilla, myself, Alexi Conta in the past or Irene Schouten, who was an inline skater herself. They really have like that tactical knowledge most. They know when to go, when not to go. Um, I think, yeah. So I think that's also why the pure, pure ice skaters struggle a little bit more in the mass start. So, but yeah, I, I also believe the mass start is, is so different to, to any single distance event. It's going to get more and more specialized. Um, yeah, so it's it's just a it's just a whole different level of speed skating. Do you think this is a kind of a theme in your career where you're sort of the lone wolf all the time? <laughs> a little bit, to be honest. Yes, absolutely. Um, I've been so many times alone, but a very interesting thing is also I learned to skate in a team very well in in power slide. So I was still a junior on inline in 2011, 2012 was my last year. Uh, and then I got the chance from the Powers Light World team on inline uh, to be in their team. So I saw, st suddenly out of nothing got teammates with Bart Swings, Felix Reinen, Peter Michael and, and all those guys. And I was like, whoa, oh my God, this is, this is amazing. 
<laughs> and I remember once I made to the team manager back then and made a comment. He's like, oh, Olivia, you got to do this, this, and this. And I kind of made a joke. Ah, I got Bart swings in the team. I don't have to do anything. <laughs> and he kind of whacked me on the head a little bit and said, yeah, if you say that one more time, you're out of the team. And I thought he was choking, but he wasn't really choking. So, yeah, there I really learned what it means to skate in a team, to win a race as a team. And that was very interesting that I have actually really been on both sides. Like on a national team level, I've always been alone, always had to do it alone. And then on a, on a, on a, on a team level, I was in the greatest team back then. And probably, like, probably still the greatest team right now. Um, so, and I learned to skate as a team. And I think that also helped me to understanding how do teams operate against you, like, and also in the master, it's a bit easier to read. There's only two person per country. So there's only certain options. If you have three, like I had at European Championships, for example, then it's it's way harder. What are they going to do? They can really mark one guy just on you. And it's just very difficult tactically to do. There's Sometimes there's also cer certain things you can do, and that's it. Sometimes you have to let a race go uh, in order to prove a point. And, uh, yeah, it's... Uh, it's it's very it's very difficult to read races tactically. It, currently, <clears throat> on on the World Cup scene, are you the only Swiss skater doing mass start? Uh, in in men. Yeah. Or in men, uh, yeah. No, we had we had some other Swiss skaters over the years, um, but yeah, their their level just wasn't quite there to right. So make generally final. speaking, and yeah. in any given yeah. weekend. And yeah. mass start on in the A group, there's only going to yeah. be one Swiss guy out there, and it's you. Yeah, unfortunately, but I, I'm very positive that's going to change in the in the near future. We got two guys coming up um, that have great potential, and I really believe they can uh, they can make the next step over the next two years, and hopefully even be at the at the Olympics with me. Cool. Well, we can't keep going back to Martin Hangi because he's my age. <laughs> Yeah, Mar 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 I think Martin's time has passed now. He, well, he's he still a, he's still doing great. He's still doing what great. a what a ridiculous <laughs> athlete he is. I mean, yeah. he's still breaking world records, uh, age class yeah, world records. Um, it's amazing, with yeah. incredible times. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm a good sprinter, but when I look at everything 1500 and above, like I. I can't even imagine putting up the times that he puts up. So he is no, it's actually a freak yeah. athlete. It is a really fun story. But when I started my skating career, I remember we had one spot for the five k that year, and uh, I had to go an insula up against Martin Henke to qualify the World Cup spot. And my God, I, I only won it by point two or point three. <laughs> I think it was definitely under a second. I would have to go back and look. And to be fair, to be absolutely fair, he would have won that spot if he had a pair. I, like, we were both in a quartet, but his pair pulled out like 30 minutes before the race and didn't race, and I had a pair. So I'm pretty sure that uh, that helped me a lot at the time, and I knew it too. So we even did the team pursuit back then, and that Swiss record with him actually he held for many, many years. It only got broken this year. Um, and uh, yeah, so I even gave him the 10k that year to basically say thank you. Um, but no, 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 he's uh, he's 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 such an incredible athlete, and he was already old, too old then, yeah, basically. But yeah, also, nice. these days, what, what's too old now? I mean, you see, you see, uh, like Claudia Pechstein. Know, you see Claudia Pechstein still doing an incredible, and not just in our sport, and in, in a lot of other sports, you see people close to 40 or over 40 now that are still doing amazing. I mean, Matt LeBron James is doing this crazy. What Tom Brady did was crazy. Yeah. But also, mm -hmm. in a lot of other sports, endurance sports, it's it's getting more and more like that. Yeah, I mean, I don't want to go way off on a tangent, but I mean, since I've immersed myself into this and, you know, training year-round and being on a team, I just, I think... Everybody, everybody can learn something from just moving and lifting heavy mm -hmm. and watching a little bit what you eat and you can feel great. You know, mm -hmm. it doesn't Absolutely. matter what age you are. You can keep being, you know, a, a relevant physical specimen if you just, you know, put a little time into it. But it helps if you're training for something, right? So 
figure out what Absolutely. sport you want to do, have something that you want to train towards, and then you can you can live a better life. Um, Hundred percent. It's just a way of living. It's uh, the most important thing with that is also to have like uh, a goal. So it doesn't mean every person has to have a goal to become Olympic champion or be an Olympian or be world champion. It's just just to have a healthier life. Um, yeah, it is so important, and you go way better through life if you if you look a little bit what you eat, if you look a little bit what you drink, if you work out two to three times a week. It, it makes yeah, you can make crazy steps like that. That's for yeah, sure. One hundred percent. So I'm glad we could uh, we could help our community with that <laughs> message. Um, I found a, a race that you did in 2015. I think it was your first World Cup. Mm -hmm. And you did a 1500. Mm -hmm. um, no, no. And in that race, you beat Nils Vanderpool. <laughs> <laughs> I think I even raced in that race. And and Martin Hange was in that race as well, which I also thought was yeah. funny. It was 2015. Yeah. So it was yeah. only eight years ago. Uh, you also did uh -huh. a 5K. Um, so do you remember your, your first experience being in a senior World Cup? Yeah, I, I do. I think that was actually my second one. Uh, oh, really? was, in, was it in Norway? I think my first one was actually still in 14 in Insel. Oh. And I remember uh, I remember from that, I remember uh, I got sick the week before. I had like the flu yeah. really bad. And I thought I can do like a 639. I just did a 646. So that was my goal. And then I did like 658. And I became last in the 5K, I think, or second to last in the 5K and last in the 1500. I couldn't even finish the master. And um, I was like, wow, okay, this is, uh, now I work my butt off to get to the World Cup. And now I'm at the World Cup and I'm last. And uh, <laughs> it was uh, eye-opening and I swore myself to never become last again. And uh, yeah, it was it was very eye opening though, and uh, it just showed me how much uh, how much work there is ahead. And uh, it was also a little bit frustrating to be honest, because you know, in line you're a junior medalist at World Championships. You're just I just got my first medals in senior European Championships and in line as well. So you're kind of in the world class in one sport. You try to do something else, and you're basically the worst in the world almost <laughs> that's how i saw it um of course. And, and yeah it is uh it's been a tough road from there yeah? and uh i'm also very proud i i hung with it and never gave up and, and kept going and kept going and kept going yeah. well you got yourself <clears throat> to the 2018 games um you skated the yeah. uh, 1505 k um so as a an athlete from a you know not a speed skating powerhouse mm -hmm. How tricky is it to understand the rules of qualification for the games? Oh, it's it's it's, it's difficult, but in the end of the day, you skate fast and uh, you qualify. That's pretty simple. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, so for sure, it's hard to qualify. Um, but the, I mean, the international qualification criteria is only one thing: you still have to be nominated by the national governing body. Or Swiss Olympic in our case, and uh, and yeah, it's just it's just a lot. But actually, with saying that, I, I really wish uh, the IOC would give speed skating a few more spots um, because it's just not fair when you really think. I think we have 188 spots, men and women combined, so 19, 90 something men, 90 something women, and then you see sometimes cross country skiers is 130. There's there's some people that can hardly stand on skis. And, and the same in alpine skiing. And I really believe like hmm. in, in, in speed skating, our level has to be so, so incredibly high, which is right. I mean, it's the Olympic Games, it's the p pinnacle, the pinnacle of sports. But then they also say something about like, oh, we want so many countries there and so on. And I mean, for a country like Switzerland or, or Romania or, or all those countries that don't have the speed skating history and and uh, for, that they're just learning how to skate basically at the moment for them to make it so incredibly hard to even go to an olympics to even go to a world championships i think this is really something the isu and the ioc has to look into it a bit and at the end of the day you, you also want countries up there because it also doesn't look good for a sport i'm sorry you look into a, a division 
5k you have five dutch five norwegians you have bart swings in there like last olympic cycle you had niels van der Poel in there and then you had three italians and maybe one french and then wow you have six countries in a race yeah. how is that how is that even how is that good for a sport i mean it's not holland's fault that they're so good it's not norway's fault that they're so good of course not but it just it just shows um that there's also a few things that still have to change that countries have to be more open for uh, for uh, foreigners to to learn how to skate and you see that also with holland now they're very they're very they're more and more closed up again they don't want to share their secrets um it's like as a foreigner to go to to heronwind to skate is, is nearly impossible the only team that slowly learns how to do it is uh team novus but i know the the fights they had to even get training times and stuff which is that is really really crazy and uh, mm. i understand holland in one way but i also wish they would be a little bit more open um but i also understand they they protect their secrets they want to be the best in the world and um yeah, I, I understand both sides for sure. So I ask this question of just about every European skater that I that I spend time with. Um, how important are European championships to you? <laughs> I, it, is, it is important, but for me, as I, because I have a New Zealand coach, he's always saying, oh, European championships are a joke. <laughs> it's, uh, <laughs> it's not the world championships. And you guys celebrate, you win like you won the world championships. But... I always grew up on, on inline and on ice that European Championships are very important, and obviously they are very important. That's not even a, it's not even a discussion. Um, but it's also funny sometimes when I see like conversations who's the greatest skater, and then you compare like some American skaters with European Dutch skaters, and then in the Dutch accolades there are oh we have ten European titles. Yeah, well cool, but the Americans couldn't take part in the European Championship, so you, you can't actually take European titles into accolades. And I know European Championships are important for for Swiss Olympic, uh, for our federation. It's very important, but it's not the World Championships, and and I know that. And I mean also now when you have training focuses. My training focus never is on the European Championships. I always try to be in the best shape possible at a at a World Cup, at a World Championship. And for me, yeah. even a World Cup victory means more than a European title. I know it doesn't mean like personally, it means more to me because I fought against the best in the world. On a European Championships, you fight against the best in Europe, which is still different pressure to do it on a on an important event, but it is not the World Championships. So when when you made it onto ice and you you became a a guy that was you know a regular um, you were pretty much a fifteen hundred five k guy, <clears throat> and then a few years after you got into the sport, then the mass start came along. Um, mm -hmm. When the mass start became a thing, did you immediately believe like, oh, this is going to be my race? I'm going to focus on this, or did you just try it and? decide or sort of figured out hey i'm really good at this yeah i mean uh the, there was the first discussions about making the master olympic i think the first world cup prize were in 13 12 13 around there and then i still remember in my first master actually in Inzel, in my first ever world cup i didn't wear a helmet so i was like wow okay and then, uh, yeah, the rules slowly came in and then it got decided that it is going to be an Olympic event in 2018. And I knew from then, spot on, that this is probably my best chance to even qualify for the Games. I never imagined myself to be, to be so great at it. And I never imagined myself to, to like, yeah, that I suddenly could beat guys that are 10, 15 seconds faster than me in a, in a, in a 5K. I, I, I didn't understand why that was. Um, my coach, Kalen, definitely saw straight away, like, yeah, yeah, yeah you're going to be good at this because mm -hmm. you know how to move and stuff. Like, he saw way more and faster that I can be good at it. Um, but, yeah, it's, it's, it's funny you say that. It's Even today, still, my dream is to become a great 5K skater. I don't know why I have that, that dream. Like my dream. My dream was always to go below 6.10. Now, now, basically, that's not even a time anymore. Now you have to go below 6.05 to even be in the conversations for metal on, on, on the fast, fast ice. Yeah. Uh, I still believe I can do that. I, I don't know if I'll ever be a world medalist in the 5K. Probably not. 
but I would still give it. I, I, I would still give it another crack at it. But I also know in saying that that my my biggest chance for Olympic medal, Olympic glory is is in the master, and I know I have to focus on that as well. And I I know that, but yeah, like I just love speed skating so much, and I love the beauty of it. And that's also something very important. It's uh, there's history of speed skating. History of speed skating is doing five k's, ten k's, five hundred meters, and not mass start. But it's also very important to to be current to to go with it. And that's why it's so important to do to do those master races. And I think it can even you can even put a sprint distance in there for the sprinters, or or like I mean the the mixed uh, not a not the not the mixed gender. I mean the the team sprint this year at the World Championships from the men. How incredible was that? You had six teams within point two. I mean, that's awesome. And, and that's that's really where the sport should go, I think, as well. It's, you have to keep some history, but you also have to be innovative. And what brings the public eye to watch speed skate? I mean, my, my friends, they say, yeah, why would we watch a 5K? Like, I don't care if you're in or not, but... <laughs> but they love a mass start because things happen, crashes happen, there's action in it. And yeah, and I think that's also why short track's doing so well now with, with the action in it. And and I think uh, speed skating just has to be a little bit more innovative with, with that. So <clears throat> that's a good segue to talk a little bit more about your, your mass start um, prowess. So just looking back at history here, um, 2019, 20, 21, 23, 24, just looking at uh, mm-hmm. world championship mass starts, uh, 7th, 13th, 6th, 4th, 3rd. Um, I think that's a good trajectory. You're, you're heading in a really good direction. Um, <clears throat> so let's talk a little bit about this world championship mass start that just happened. Um, mm-hmm. So early in the race, there was a little bit of, a, a little bit of contact. Oh, yeah. And we can look at uh, this series of images here. Uh-huh. It's crazy. And, uh, it's so crazy. From, from our perspective and from the perspective of the guy that was uh, doing the announcing, it looked like, you know, you had contact with Bart uh, Holworth and, mm-hmm. you know, the two of you sort of ended up grabbing each other as you were down. Was, was he helping you up? Yeah, hundred percent. He was giving me a hand to come back up, and I went straight after the race to him to say thank you to him. Um, he was very angry at that moment, but of course, he's an he's an athlete. He was he was full of emotions. He didn't reach his goal. So yeah, um, yeah. Just I just said thank you to him several times for helping me up, and yeah, it's quite a funny thing. Already in the start of the year, I had a crash. In Beijing, because also some contact with him, uh, which didn't end well. I finished last in that race, I think, because it was in the last straight or second to last straight where I crashed. But yeah, it's just must art. It, it happens. Like you fight for position, and uh, many times only one can get the position, and uh, crashes do happen. And uh, yeah, there's. Uh, I was just very happy that this this happened at that moment. I also remember, like, I didn't even realize it happened. I was up again, and then half a, half a lap later, I I realized um, that, uh, that, oh my God, I crashed. And then my legs suddenly got super shaky. I was uh, I was just in the back of the pack, trying to get, grip, get a grip again, and it took me a couple laps to, to kind of recover from it and then it was only like five six laps to go where i was like okay i'm back i'm good i got to go again but before that i really really struggled i was even like dropping off a bit from with the accelerations because it just was my legs were not working at that moment and i'm really glad i got the got the got the adrenaline back at the right time so i watched this race extensively in preparation Mm -hmm. for for this discussion And unfortunately, the broadcast didn't give me all the angles that I wanted, but I do want to show this one image. So mm-hmm. this is with about three and a half laps to go. Yeah. And you can see, of course, uh, Timothy is, is trying to break away as usual, but yeah. it's, it's hard to see. But you are probably about seventh or eighth. You're kind of in the middle of the pack to the left. Mm-hmm. And Bart Swings is over on the right. Mm-hmm. And... When I watch this, 
in, in the span of about three quarters of a lap or maybe just a couple of corners, you manage to get from the right side kind of back in the pack to directly behind Bart Swings, which is what I think you wanted. Um, mm -hmm. Here's another image of it, uh, kind of the same thing where you're kind of in the middle, Bart is sort of more on the mm -hmm. inside. But then as soon as we get two to go, uh, really three corners to go, now all of a sudden there you are directly behind Bart, <laughs> right where you want to be. <laughs> and now yep. the, the other guys are starting to drop off. And what I thought was interesting is my buddy Ethan Separin, he was right mm -hmm. there. He was right behind Bart. And yep. as soon as it was time to go, um, he just, you know, on that day, he didn't have the ability to hang with it. So that's, mm -hmm. to me, Part of what's really fascinating about mass start is you've got to be able to sprint, but you also have to be able to um, just have this incredible level of endurance um, because it's 16 laps and yeah, there's times where you're coasting, but every time a French guy takes off, you know, the whole field suddenly is going to sprint and it's just this reaction and slow down and react and and you're trying to shove your way into the position you want. So that's a lot of me talking. I want mm -hmm. to ask you in that moment, were you trying to figure out how to get behind Bart Swings? Um, no, it was not. Uh, my goal wasn't be to behind Bart Swings. That was that was never the goal, even though a lot of people think that because I end up a lot there. The problem is Bart is so damn good. He's always in the right position. And uh, so he's one of the best blades to have i can't say wheel we're not on wheels yeah. um and yeah it's it's back to back to the inline pass bart is one of the greatest inline skaters in the world he knows when to go what to do what we have to do and he managed he it happened to be that he was at the position where i wanted to be and actually it all happened in one corner where i moved up it happened in the in the bottom actually in the finished corner with two and a half laps to go. That's where I made my move to, to move up. And I knew at the time, it was like, now I have to move up or if I start to sprint in eighth, yeah, the maximum I can get is fourth or fifth. I will be too far back. And I knew I had to be up front. I knew I had the speed to follow from training. Uh, I knew I knew I could do myself a free 23-4, 23-5 from the front, but I knew that that's probably not gonna win. So my goal was to be in, a, in second or third position going into the last lap and then see if I can overtake. And I think I had an even better chance if Bart wouldn't have sprinted for so damn long, but he did almost a two lap sprint to, to catch the French, which is when you really think he went, he went 750 meters full. And, uh, and then Antoine had a really nice run in on us and I just didn't quite have the legs on that last straight to, to came past. Yeah. I actually had probably the, the best chance to win. I had the best, position to win i just didn't quite manage to do it and that's what i have to do better in the future for sure well let's watch that uh that final piece this is a good one and a really good corner by antoine yeah it was amazing from him yeah but with him it was the same he had he had a really nice run in i talked to him after the race we both just did not quite have the legs to get past part i mean you see how close it was and and then, yeah, I think Antoine did a 22.9. I mean, that's so incredible fast. <laughs> and Bard and I managed 23.3s or 23.2, something like that. So, yeah, that's crazy. It's um, the, the race gets so fast now. And uh, if you can't do those low 23s at the end of the races, even on European eyes, we're on 23.5s, 23.6s. And then uh, and I think in Japan, we did back-to-back 3.6, 3.8 for the podium places. So... So it's just the level gets higher and higher, like like in any sport. And <laughs> we probably just have to wait until Jordan Stoltz is doing it. That would be in the twenty two fives to medal. So, <laughs> so yeah, we'll see what happens when he comes. <laughs> Were you the youngest guy on that podium? Actually, I don't know. I don't know who's younger, if Antoine or me. Actually, that's a good yeah, question. You two. I know I'm younger than Bart. Yeah, you two are real close. Uh, yeah. Yeah, that, but I, I think that's also a testament of, of uh, you need some kind of experience in the master. Yeah. Without it's, question. Uh, of course not. Of course, young ones, I don't say the young ones can't win or can't do good. That's not the case because at European Championships, 
I actually made a massive mistake with one lap to go left. We call it left the door open on the inside. And then suddenly Alan Dahl Johansson and, and Gabriel Order were on the inside of me and kind of pushed me off behind Giovannini and, and Bart. And I even managed to pass Giovannini. No, not Gio I, was, I wasn't even Giovannini. But yeah, we, me and Giovannini just really messed up the positioning there. And it can happen all the time. It's it's just, yeah, like you learn every single race, you learn something new and you think a master is going one way, it never goes that way. It's like, I used to have tactics with my coach where we really specifically decided we're going to do this, we're going to do that. But like right now we, we can't make a tactic anymore. We The only thing we say is that, uh, yeah, right, uh, my coach sees in the semifinal, hey, um, Giovannini looked incredibly well. He's a guy you can focus on. He'll be there in the end. He's like, hey, whole work is moving really well. That's that's okay. Or he also sees sometimes, like, and sometimes, hey, um, Korean today is not is not the guy to be on. He, he looked tired. And he, he, he can only give me information like that from the semifinals uh, because normally it's too fast between semifinal and final. And, um, yeah, then... Uh, Everything else I'll do basically out of instinct. Um, it's just experience, a lot, a lot of experience, and you have to learn what to do at what time, and sometimes you still do the wrong decision too. It's part of it. So it seems like lately the the two French guys and the two German guys have a tendency to try to do mm -hmm. these big breakaways. Um, mm -hmm. Is that something that you've ever done? Yeah, in the past I've done a little bit more breakaways for sure. My first ever fourth place was off a breakaway. I just happened to be with Jorik Bergsma and uh, he was a bit too strong. And uh, yeah, I actually got twice fourth in, in breakaways. And that's the beauty about the sport. You can win it in a breakaway, um, you can win it in a sprint. And uh, it makes the race so much more interesting. And it's just uh, the French guys know they're they're not the fastest guys yet. Um, so they have to break away gotcha. and uh, same with the French uh, same with the Germans or, or someone like Peter Michael they know they have their chance and uh, and then yeah it's always the responsibility of the pack um, who closes those gaps uh, I'm sometimes or most of the time in a quite decent position because I'm alone and uh, I don't have to do it and that's for example something that makes Bart Swings so special because a lot of times he's alone too but he's so damn strong he can still close and still win the sprint so yeah that's it's really incredible what he does but yeah like lately the Italians had a lot of responsibility to close gaps or the Dutch had where they had clear team tactics Bosker was there for Holger for Di Stefano was there for Cavanini and I think this is also something you're going to see more and more in the in the future of the sport literally one guy is there for the other guy and uh, yeah it's just but it's also cool like and you go into a and you go into a 1k and you knew okay Jordan Stolz is probably going to win if he doesn't crash and you knew which people were going to be second third and fourth you more or less knew what's going to happen in a master, uh, yeah, you always have the favorites. The favorites always going to do good, but you don't know what's going to happen. Like, there's guys like Gabriel Odor. He can be 16th. He can be on the podium, and and the same counts for me. Or, or then you have like guy like Alan Dal Johansson who just got a European medal and he didn't even qualify for the final. Olympic champion Sung Hoon Lee didn't qualify for the final. And that's that's also really 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 cool to to see that that so much can happen. Do you feel like the um, the guys that have the strong inline background? Um, do you kind of look out for each other uh, on the ice in the mass start? Do you feel like there's kind of a bond there, or is it more like familiarity breeds contempt, <laughs> or is it probably a mix? I mean, it seems like you and swings are are friends. Yeah, we're definitely. I mean, we were in a we were in a team together, and uh, on in line. And uh, it's funny you mentioned that. Um, there's definitely some bond there, and uh, I'm always happy for for inline skaters if they do good. Of course, I want to do better personally, but but yeah, it it also meant an awful lot to actually be on the podium with with him because we did so many races together and. Uh, and yeah, it, it meant a lot to me. But I also have like a really strong bond, like to, to Andrea Ciovanini, for example. It's just you, you you learn to respect each other, and and that's the great thing about the sport. It's not not always about just winning. It's also how you do it, and 
and one of the greatest things is also when people can be happy for you around you and and then vice versa as well of course and but i wouldn't say that we necessarily look out for each other us inliners but we just know so we're good at it i i, I think yeah. that's it for and sure. we know each other for from so many inline races too and uh i mean it's a really funny thing so on so many inline podiums at european or worlds where i've been um bart swings was on it and it just shows uh it's not coming from nowhere of course i'm gonna yeah. keep an eye on him like for example at the Olymp last olympics my tactics was just you from the first moment to the end you stay behind bart swings that's it that was my that was my tactic then because i knew i didn't have the legs to do anything in the race i was completely dead from the semi-final i was still battling the covid uh the covid aftermath and i just knew okay we knew bart is going to be there i don't we didn't know if he was going to win but we knew if I'm going to be behind him, I'm going to go at least into the last step in a great position. The problem was it was actually not the position to be, which I also had to learn. I cannot always focus on one person so much. Um, and I have to learn to race my own races, not not focus too much on one single person. That was really something I learned, I learned that year. And uh, right now I can say everything goes pretty well. I know what I'm doing, but next year everything is going to look different again um, you're going to have to shape hers to be good enough you also got to race to your shape um i know when bard is for example in the in his best level he's not chasing every gap but when he knows oh i'm really on today then he decides he wants to win this race then he races completely different too and uh yeah you just have to learn to to listen to your body when it comes to that as well so let's <clears throat> let's transition a little bit so let's talk a little bit about two things. One is yep. the current state of speed skating in Switzerland. Mm -hmm. And secondly, um, the challenges you have as a two sport athlete um, from the financial standpoint. How do, you, how do you make all this work? But let's start with the state of, of speed skating in Switzerland. So what, what is the situation with you know, a so-called national team you know, coaching? Mm -hmm. what, Bring us up to speed. What's going on in Switzerland? So, yeah, I mean, Switzerland, when you look back, I unfortunately haven't been skating back then, but I mean, Switzerland has a great history in speed skating with Davos, with all the few, all the past world records when we were still outdoors. We we're actually from Davos with altitude. People love to go there for training camps. And I mean, I did my very first lap in ice skating still on that rink. Unfortunately, a year later, it closed down. and. Switzerland never managed to jump on board to, to build a proper speed skating track. So when I started speed skating, we had some some great talents, sometimes like a Caitlin McGregor, who just got a medal at Junior Worlds, but then retired uh, very, very soon after that. And then we just had some past skaters that did great, like Franz Krienbull, the inventor of the speed skating suit. And then we had Martin Feigenman, who was a great 10K skater. And then we had like a guy like Roshi Schneider, who not so long ago, unfortunately, passed away. So yeah, we never had a team or anything like that. And uh, so it was very, very interesting. So what actually happened is my, my coach had built up an inline skating group. And that, that's very interesting. And uh, I was one of the first, like, they all started skating on ice slowly, but in all different kind of ways. And I was just the first to really take or take foot in an international level and uh so you also could write a, a book about it but um the story behind it is just uh so after the 18 olympics after after my results the the federation got some more more funding to invest into speed skating long track speed skating and they did that they employed my coach Kaylon dobbin as a national coach and that was the first time ever we had a Swiss national team training together in Inzo. Uh, we even had an assistant coach, uh, and um, it looked all really great. But then uh, Swiss Olympic changed some things with coaching papers, because for Swiss Olympic, it's really important that a lot of Swiss coaches are involved in the sport. So unfortunately, my coaching papers from my coach weren't, weren't good enough for whatever quite the reason was, I don't really know. Anyway, his contract didn't go uh, extended after Beijing 
And so we took Switzerland took a massive step backwards when it came to that. So the the kind of the, the Swiss national team was still established, but we suddenly had no no coach anymore. So what we all sat together, and uh, we're about ten athletes, and we just said, look, we want to continue with Kale, and we had great results. And for us, it, we, we would have had the chance to go with the new Swiss national coach, um, but we didn't want to do that because we didn't want to make a stay backwards move to Switzerland where there's not even a proper ice track. Um, so that was just never really a question for us. So we all decided to pay Kalen privately somehow. Um, we try to manage as good as we can. It's very challenging when it comes to that. Um, I invest a lot, of, a lot of money myself into the whole team and trying to pay Kalen, but I try, not, I try to want to make it keep going because I couldn't do it alone. You, you need a team to succeed. Um, and it is not necessarily always just in having the best training partners in the world. It, it comes down to so many people. You need, you need, you know, you need the soul in the team that, that always knows what to say at the right time. It's, <laughs> it's not always just about performance. You need, you need, you need the person that, <sighs> I don't know, books the place at the restaurant for the team dinner, you know, it's, it's, it's just really crazy and cool how it works with us all, but it works somehow and we, we want to keep going for sure until after, and until to the next Olympics. The, the challenging part for us is just the financial part, and, uh, but we, we try to manage as good as we can and then we go on from there. Yeah. And who knows, maybe, uh, um, maybe the Federation can employ the coach one day again, that would be awesome, it would be a helping us a lot financially but i also know it's politics is politics and that is never easy and i also don't want to focus too much on on the political side of things i just want to skate as good as i can and uh, do it with the people i love the people i need and i know i need kaylin on the way to the olympics i know that nice well <clears throat> i think that's a an easy segue to you're going to stay in the sport um at least through 26, um, to try to get that medal that you were looking for. Um, you know, maybe a gold one. Um, have That's you thought much, <laughs> have you thought much about, uh, life after 26 or life after skating for that matter? Yeah. I want to, I want to be involved also in the sport somehow after skating. So I actually, I actually am the, in the team management for, the team arena guys in on inline skates so i manage a lot of things there um i start building a company slowly for speed skating i don't really know to be honest in which direction i want to go yet uh, i want to also continue to work together with my coach he's going to be focused more on the coaching side of things i'll try to focus a bit more on the business side of things uh, our dream is definitely to have a program going for for inliners that want to jump on ice um that really focuses on 365 day programs on inline and on ice we're gonna have a collaboration together without a doubt that's that's kind of like the future what we want to and uh we want to we want to keep working together because we know we we have a really unique thing we have a lot of experience especially my coach he's coached so many inliners on ice now and uh and that's that's really nice to see what what he does with certain people and uh yeah, we we we'll see we we'll see what happens in the future. But right now, I'm still main focused on on inline and eh, on inline skating or on ice skating, of course. And uh, I want to do I want to do great in, in 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 the sport and everything. In the next two years goes goes towards that. That's for sure. What's the focus this summer? Do you have a specific thing that you really want to accomplish? Is it a level of fitness or strength or is there anything specific? Yeah, we, we built a lot of, we had a lot of strength training, different strength training, what we've never really done last year. And we, we felt we haven't really got the benefits fully out of it. So we want to see how that comes this year. That That's one thing if we still need to adjust some things towards the Olympic season. Uh, so that's the strength part. And then we definitely want to work on the technique, the corner technique especially, as it's so important in the mass start. So that will be a big focus also on, on inline skates. And then, yeah, without a doubt, uh, probably the main focus right now this year will be on the endu endurance. So we know we lost a little bit the last couple of years with the injury and uh, 
after COVID and everything. So there will be a lot of uh, miles done on bike and on inline skates. I don't know if it's going to be quite Niels Vanderpool like, but it's, it's <laughs> we're going to try to get up to those kind of numbers. That's for sure. Seven hours a day. Uh, five, five, five to six is okay as well. <laughs> So recently we switched from uh, semi-final to final and now it's just group A and group B with mass start. Do you have a preference? Mm -hmm. I mean, I understand the ISU in this, this matter. I understand all the athletes. I mean, also for me, like a normal race weekend can be 1500, 5K, mass start and team pursuit. And to have another mass start in there, it's it's a lot. It's 16 laps pain. So I, I understand to take one race out and make it A and B group, make it exactly the same as, as every other race. Um, but yeah, it's it's also tough because if you want in B group, it's so hard to get to A group to even qualify for world championships. I don't know if that's the right way to go for the for the Olympic season, but then it's the same in, in, in kind of any other distance. So it's, uh, it's, it's a bit different. The thing is, in, in the single distance events, you know, normally you have like that one race, you know, in an Olympic season, you know, okay, this is the World Cup in Calgary and Salt Lake. This is very fast, times are being skated. So if you're a B group skater, you know exactly okay, this is where I have to perform, this is where the fastest times are being skated. So you kind of can focus on that and it doesn't matter if, you're, if it's B or A, sometimes it's even an advantage to be in B. And for example, I had a grade 5K in the B division in, um, in, the, in the last Olympic season and I kicked some people out that skated the whole season A division. Is that fair to me? I don't believe it's fair. So, but to me, make it fair for every single skater out there, I think it's nearly impossible. But to your question, I, I think it's, I think it's, I don't know, I think, I think it's the right decision to, to go to A and B group. In the start, I was fully against it. <laughs> but um, I, I really, I really can see why, why it is like that. I can really see it. So it's just the way it is. We have to, we have to deal with it. Whatever, whatever the ISO decides in the end, we have to get accustomed to and, and, and learn from it. But I think there's actually bigger issues the ISU probably could look at. It's for example, like this year, certain skaters had to skate a 10K and then a 1500 meter right after, or in the women's a 5K and then a 1500 meter right after. I really believe that's two distances you cannot put together because, yeah. my God, you can't do a 5K full out and then a 1500. If it's at least a 1500 first and then the 5 and 10K. I, I can say I get that, but even that is just not, it's not right. It's, it's, uh, but then on any other races or any other day, you get an overlap, but then just start championship on Wednesday with the 1500 and we don't have that problem. And yeah, I think why not one, one more day, uh, championship, it's the world championships. You want the best skaters in each event. You don't want to see suddenly people pulling out at the 10k because they want to focus on the 1500. But yeah. like that, you destroyed Patrick Ruth's chance in the 1500 meter after after he just got fourth in the 10K. How, how is that fair? A dude has to do 25 laps all out and then try to do a 1500 an hour and a half later. Yeah. I just really think that's not that's not fair, yeah. So I think just the simple solution is just start one day earlier and you can get the races in and you can even then put the mixed gender relay in before the 10K or something like Put, use the time you don't have for a show event or something or yeah. something new every year but there's so much more things you can do but I believe at the world championships you want the best skaters in every single event and I think it's how it, that's how it should be gotcha um, this might be an unfair question but sometimes I think this is interesting so without giving it too much thought if I asked you to tell me like if you can think of a moment, like the the highest moment in inline or in, in ice, like mm -hmm. what what is there something that just jumps into your head? Yeah, for sure. So I had what well, my, my big moment on ice was probably my first ever World Cup medal. It came quite surprisingly. Um, I had absolutely no pressure. I just call it. I just we we officially just knew. The day before, I'm, I'm qualified for the Olympics in uh, in Pyeongchang, and then we had the the mass start to to skate. So it was the last event of the weekend, and everyone was racing it. Pressure was up, pressure was just off, and 
so back then I raced most masters just to go out for points to have a good result to qualify or to get enough World Cup points to qualify for the Olympics so we also knew there I can crash I can be DQ I'll have enough points to qualify so my coach told me hey man uh, let's risk something just follow this Korean guy Sung Hoon Lee the whole race and then try to follow him when he starts his sprint like, okay cool <laughs> so that was our plan and uh, Sung Hoon Lee like in the past he was just in the back all the race he did not care if there was a breakaway or not I just followed and followed and was like how can this guy be so patient and it's like how is he technically so good skating with hands in the back through corners <laughs> just like it's nothing and I was just amazed more than than even thinking about what could happen in the race I was just amazed following him and then yeah it was like two laps ago he slowly started moving up in the sprints and he moved so fast and so agile i couldn't even follow him so i completely lost him <laughs> and then with a lap to go with a lap to go i somehow found him again it was one one uh, place behind him i think i entered the last lap in seventh and he en entered it in sixth and then he passed every single person out of that second to last corner on the inside the whole pack panicked and swung into him. I stayed outside and then I could build the perfect corner and swing under uh, the whole pack in the in the last corner and I finished second behind him. And that was that was like the first like, whoa, oh my God, I can sprint too. I, <laughs> I, uh, but I was still so amazed how I tried to follow a guy, but I couldn't follow him because he was so much better than me. <laughs> and uh, that, that race just worked out absolutely perfect for me. But it was like the first time where I started believing that I can be really good in the in the master. And of course, it was my first World Cup podium. And uh, yeah, it was it was a really special. Uh, it was a really really special one. Yeah. Nice. How about inline? Yeah, on inline I have. Uh, it's it's also it's, I feel it's always like the first medal or the first win or something you get. And uh, on inline, I just have that one moment on on inline where I got my first ever. Um, it actually wasn't. It actually wasn't a. It actually wasn't a win. I got fourth. Um, by like that much, and it was my first ever Uni European Championship in senior. I finished fourth, and it broke my heart. I finished fourth, but it made me somehow hungry, hungrier for more. But it's just. just it's funny that a fourth place sticks out to me way more than a, than a medal, but it, it, I still remember it so good in front of me. And then, yeah, of course, every single medal on Europeans and, and, and it meant a lot to me because it's not common for, for a small nation like Switzerland to, to do that. So yeah. it all means a lot, but yeah, definitely the career highlight for me is the, just a recent world medal on, on ice. So, and I try to get some more, hopefully. How about uh, the opposite? Or can you think of when you're at your lowest, like with your ice career? Yeah, I, I think that was in Beijing after the the mass start. Um, I I knew before COVID I was in the shape to to win the race. I right. I felt I was as strong as a guy like Bart, and I felt I was as fast as a guy like, or at least I could follow guys like Joey Mantia, no problem. And I knew I was I was incredibly good. Uh, my 5K was going great. My 1500 wasn't that great that, that anymore, but it was still decent. And I was just in such a great shape. And then COVID happened. I tried to stay positive. Then finished seventh at the games in the master, which under the circumstances was still okay. But I just only thought for four years about this race and about the medal, mm -hmm. and I couldn't do it. And it just broke my heart in that very moment. And it was quite beautiful at the moment because Sung Hun Lee trained with with us for the whole week before the race, and I think he got second or third. I don't I don't remember, but he, he definitely got a medal. And he came up to me and, and told me my time will come. So that, that meant a lot to me. Hmm. And uh, yeah, my time came at Worlds with a medal at least. So we'll see if it comes at the Olympics one day. But like I said, I'll keep fighting, and it's not always. An athlete is not always how you win; it's how you get up again and keep fighting. And but yeah, Beijing definitely, definitely broke my heart. Yeah, that's yeah. For, that's for damn sure. Well, your trajectory with the the mass start right now, it just it keeps getting better. Um, <laughs> so it, it. I'm also not keep getting younger though, so we'll see. <laughs> 
Well, like we talked about before, I, you know, the age doesn't matter. You get a lot of experience, so you can use mm-hmm. that to your advantage when we get to 26. And it'll be curious to see who's in the pack uh, by the time. Exactly. I mean, two years is definitely is a long time. Be there. There's a lot of things that can happen. So hopefully, uh, yeah. that cool Swiss skin suit will still be uh, in the mix. Um, I really appreciate you taking the time to hang out with us today. Um, we kind of threw this one together at the last minute, but uh, it's always fun to research you guys and, and learn about your careers and have you tell the stories. So thank you for being with us. This was a, a great episode with Livio Wenger, and we are out of here. Thank you so much.